Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I wanted to feature a project that's nearing completion, and it's uh, project number 1416, which uses a 300 hertz co-entrant horn. And so you can see it pictured here as a render. And so this particular customer needed the vintage appearance to fit with the rest of the de decor in his home. And so despite the vintage appearance, um, this uh, speaker is certainly packed with uh, some pretty good technology, modern technology. So um, in this video, I'm going to walk through the technical design and also show you some test results that I've been able to come up with for the co-entrant horn. And so um, I'm just going to skip right to the SolidWorks to show you uh, the specifics of this. And so just quickly, the base cabinet itself uses a 15-inch uh, JBL differential drive woofer from their uh, Pro Audio uh, part, part shelf. And then it's using the Hypex FA523 uh, plate amp. So um, there's gonna be an option for either passive or active in this particular, uh, for this particular project. So um, I'm going to show you the uh, test results with the passive crossover. So you can see here um, the co-entrant design. It's using uh, three inch uh, mid-range drivers, the ScanSpeak 10F, drivers along with the ViaWave SRT7 Pure Ribbon Tweeter. So you can see it there. So um, this came after about three previous test builds of various prototypes where I was able to have moderate success, I guess, with the previous revisions. There was some pretty severe frequency response dips and peaks in the mid-range. Um, and so this is the final result that you see here, which um, produced acceptable results, I think, you'll see. Um, the trick here is actually in the phase plug. Uh, the mid-range drivers actually need to be as close as possible to the horn throat. Otherwise, there's um, these uh, exit holes create cancellation effects uh, through the pass band on the mid-range. And so you can see here that I've gone to extreme lengths to pock not only I had to pocket out the surround and then get the driver as close as possible and then come up with these uh, elliptical shapes um, to get the uh, sound from the mid-range into the throat uh, without causing any disturbances both from the high frequency or from the mid-range uh, itself. So you can see here that the exit is primarily centered in the middle of the driver so that we're not getting, if I had pre in previous revisions, I had the whole offset, which actually caused um, some some dips in the frequency response. It was a, basically a cancellation as it um, from the distance from this edge of the surround to the to the hole there. So now it, all it is actually is when I'm seeing C, CNC machining this, I'm just uh, using the end mill to do perfect circles, but they end up creating this ideal elliptical shape. Um, so now this was uh, pushing the limit for me. Uh, both in terms of being able to design and model this in SolidWorks, but also being able to machine it, uh, which it's machined out of solid hardwood. So, um, yeah, so it's it's a little bit tricky to get, um, but I think I got pretty close with this design. For me, um, it's the first kind of foray, in, foray into co-entrant configurations. Um, however, I did have to do a number of prototypes to get to where I'm at. So. Uh, and there's still improvements to come um, from even the latest revision. There's still some changes that I'd like to make, uh, which I can show you uh, based on the test data. So, um, so let's skip um, to the test results here. I first started by uh, measuring the raw frequency response of the mid-range only. Um, you can see the horn here in the unsanded state. So I'll, I'll, bring, I'll go back up to that in a second. But... Um, Raw frequency response for the mid-range, um, I was getting good extension down to about 350 hertz. And then it has a relatively uh, flat uh, frequency response out to about 1.8 kilohertz. Um, so I was happy to see that there was nothing uh, in previous revisions, I was getting pretty a pretty irregular response, and uh, especially as it got up into the mid range, I'd see cancellations. Um, so it's it was quite tricky to achieve uh, what I'm what I'm showing here. So um, I'll just skip back up. So um, you can see uh, the horn with the phase, or I call it the phase 
throat throat plug, I guess I'd call it. Now, um, the horn is shown here in the unstained state, so I'll show it later on, actually probably in an Instagram post with it stained, but the horn looks quite beautiful, um, stained. I'm just gonna make sure it's still recording here. Yeah. Um, so you can see here that I've rigged up a passive crossover using alligator clips, and so this is how I normally do my testing and crossover development. So I'll, I'll uh, use XM3D to uh, come up with uh, preliminary configuration for the crossover and then I'll test with the microphone, do some critical listening, uh, go back and change some values or uh, make some changes to the crossover and reevaluate. And so that process happens over and over and over dozens of times until I get it uh, optimally to, um, you know, using a variety of soundtracks and music, uh, listening to what is uh, subjectively the best. So um, that's just a you know the 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 normal process. The crossover is really the heart of the speaker, and that's something that typically you really have to wrestle with. Uh, so, just showing here a cutaway of the horn and how the mid-range drivers are. Uh, they have to be p positioned as close as possible, both to the throat of the horn, but also as close as possible to the the high-frequency driver, um, so that we maintain a good physical time alignment between the distance of the drivers and get the best step response possible. Um, if the step response isn't good, uh, then you've pretty much wasted the point of doing a co-entrant design. Um, the, the point of a co-entrant design like this is to optimize uh, maximum coherency and uh, intelligibility uh, through the, the horn's pass band. So in this case, it's from 300 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Okay, so um, this is the actual results here for the passive crossover that I was able to come up with. And so this part of it um, is the, the uh, low pass portion cutting off at about 1.8 kilohertz. And then there is a contour circuit on the via wave tweeter to flatten the response. And so the, the end result is shown here between the mid range and treble. And you can see uh, good flatness with a crossover point of around two and a half kilohertz. Um, now the, the key here is the step response. Uh, you can see that we have the via wave coming in with a, a really sharp uh, step response and then you have the mid range coming in. So we're seeing perfect time alignment. Um, and so that actually was reflected in my listening tests um, where I was able to get just tremendous coherency and uh, intelligibility, intelligibility, like I mentioned. Um, so there's, it's, it's something that's I believe is unique with co-entrant designs. There's a certain uh, sound character where it's, it's very easy to listen to, um, but you'll see that it's not without its compromises in a little bit here. So uh, with the passive crossover, I did um, the impedance sweep there. You can see that the uh, minimum point is 3.8 ohms at three kilohertz there with the via wave dipping down to 3.8. So um, now I did burst decay with an ungated response in my uh, studio. And so you can see that it's relatively clean uh, with a 25 dB vertical scale, increasing the vertical scale to 35 dB, but I also gated out because I was uh, getting some room interaction here. So uh, it's clean in the upper treble. There's a broad Q uh, resonance there at around 10 kilohertz. That's about 10 dB down. Um, it's questionable whether that would actually be audible or not. So um, the spectral decay is showing some very low level uh, resonances through, through the bandwidth. Now, this is um, probably where the weakest uh, metric is for the co-entrant design. Um, this is an area where I hope to improve uh, with future revisions. So now you can see the mid-range uh, gradually narrows, but then by 1.5 kilohertz, it really sharply narrows. And that's due to the way that the mid-range drivers are arranged. So with this particular uh, revision, the mid-range drivers are arranged horizontally, and you can see the the spacing there is about 80 millimeters. And so what that is actually doing is causing a narrowing of the directivity because of the width of the sound source in the, in the throat of the horn. And then as the tweeter takes over, you can see it widen back out. So the pure ribbon tweeter has a 20 millimeter wide diaphragm. And so it's much narrower than the, the mid-range drivers. And so it's going to cause a, a widening of the
the coverage. And then it gradually narrows um, down to uh, around a 70 degree coverage pattern through the rest of its bandwidth. So looking at the vertical off axis, um, it's quite different than the horizontal. Mainly, I wanted to point out, uh, I guess, two things. So firstly, with the mid-range, you can see that the mid-range, um, I'll just go back to my CAD model here. So when we're doing the vertical off axis, the mid-range drivers are actually orientated like this. So you have um, a very narrow um, uh, horizontal width for the mid-range drivers and so you can see that result where the mid-range is actually very wide coverage um, when you're when you're looking at it in the vertical axis um, and then it gradually narrows at around four and a half kilohertz um, this this narrowing here is, is a result of the the height of the ribbon tweeter being around I think it's 50 millimeters and so um, you're going to see a, a narrow directivity in the vertical as a result of that so this is an area where I think can be improved um, in future revisions. Um, I'm going to orientate the mid-range drivers vertically so that um, we get better off-axis in the horizontal. Um, looking at distortion, I decided to measure harmonic to start. And so we can see that at 2 kilohertz at an 85 dB test signal, um, second harmonic is 0.07%. And then um, the third and fourth harmonics are also quite low as well. Um, so the, the uh, harmonic distortion remains quite low across the bandwidth of the coentrant horn. Um, looking at intermodulation distortion, I started with an 80 dB test signal. Uh, this is an eight band per octave multi-tone test. And so we can observe the side band products, this grass, dark grass area down, down low in, into the noise floor. And so you can see that it's achieving a minus 70 dB um, noise, signal to noise ratio on the intermodulation. Um, increasing to, to 85 dB, you can see the grass start to come up. And then uh, by 90 dB, we can see that uh, the worst case scenario is that the distortion is minus 50 dB in the 1.5 kilohertz region. So this is uh, acceptable um, for this. And so um, looking um, just subjectively on this, um, I was very careful to take some notes on this. So um, I do think that this design captures the level of coherency that's only available from point source. Um, but you do see uh, with the off-axis polars that there are uh, compromises um, compared to having dedicated horns for each part of the frequency bandwidth. And so is the trade-off worth it? Well, um, I think it depends on um, your own, uh, what you value, whether you value a perfect off-axis or whether you value um, you know, coherency and um, intelligibility through the mid-range and treble. So I think a lot of people um, would value the later. And uh, I think there's just certain, there's a certain ease about the sound um, when there's that point source coherency. So now I did something a little different here. I wanted to just provide some context on my test data against um, some other common designs that are co-entrant or concentric. And so I've chosen um, kind of just randomly three different commercially available designs that are um, co-entrant. First being the Danley uh, SH50. It's a large format constant directivity horn that uses uh, mid-range and compression drivers uh, to do a co-entrant configuration. And so I wanted to start just by showing the manufacturer's published data. You can see here that it looks really good. Um, and then uh, Aaron's audio corner did a test on this uh, particular speaker with the Klippel near field scanner. And you can see here the uh, resulting frequency response. And so I've actually changed the aspect ratio of the image uh, to more of a four by three uh, format shape, just so that it's more of an apples to apples comparison with my test data, with my graphs, they're more of a four by three format. So it just visually provides a more comparable um, response there. So um, you can see that the response is, is not nearly as uh, consistent as what I was able to achieve. Now, admittedly, um, the SH50 is intended for pro audio applications where 
you have the uh, constant directivity horn flare geometry and so it's often difficult to get a flat response from the uh, constant directivity or CD type of horns. Now um, another speaker that I looked at was also tested by Aaron's Audio Corner which is the uh, DIY sound group Volt 8. Now it's a coaxial pro audio driver, an 8 inch that's, you know, an 8 inch woofer with a compression driver. Um, and so you can see the test data here that it's uh, quite irregular in the frequency response. And so um, I just mainly show this to provide, um, you know, I don't want people getting the impression that my results look bad because it's so common for manufacturers to publish beautiful graphs. And so it gives this kind of false standard that um, you know my, my results aren't achieving uh, anything that's comparable to what other people publish. This, this is a, a really good result. And by showing um, you know, other third-party results that it's providing some, some comparison, some good comparison. Um, another product that's interesting, the third one that I wanted to show was the Genelec 8331A studio monitor, which um, Aaron's audio corner, he did publish the step response on this, which you can see here. I was hoping that he'd publish the step response on the, the Danley SH50 so that I could compare. Uh, that with mine, but he didn't publish that. So um, you can see here that the step response is quite irregular. You can see the tweeter coming in and then the mid-range uh, quite, quite a ways after, probably uh, one millisecond later. Um, however, the feather in the cap with the Genelac is the flat frequency response, which I'm not sure how they were able to re achieve a flat response with the step response looking this way. Normally when there's a physical misalignment in the drivers, then there's there's going to be issues in the frequency response, but um, I'm not sure how they did that. Uh, but it's a beautiful frequency response with very consistent off-axis. So um, another that's an area that certainly needs to be addressed. So I say all this um, to point out that the this type of a design is very challenging, and you can I show all of this test data to kind of highlight uh, where the industry is at as far as objective test data. Um, and also, I wanted to point out too that this is a really popular uh, subset of the hobby trying to design a co-entrant uh, horn. And so a lot of people use the Acabac software to simulate the acoustical response inside uh, the stack about software by importing a 3D model and seeing how it performs. Um, every simulation that I've seen, they don't actually simulate what happens at the horn mouth with the transition around to the sides of the speaker. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, if you do get into the simulation software, to really try to look at what's happening um, at the horn mouth and that. So um, it's a really popular uh, subset, a lot of people doing 3D printing and coming up with some really interesting designs. It's, a, it's an exciting part of the hobby. So um, I'll be doing the Nighthawk shortly and providing test results on that. Um, so it's going to be interesting to do a, a comparison between the Nighthawk and this particular project to see how they, how they both compare. So that's it for today. Um, I'll be probably featuring this in some more videos um, with the finished build results, which looks quite, quite beautiful. So take care and have a great day.